It is good to see you guys. Uh, today we're going to be starting a little four-week series on vision. Um, you know, we were going to look at we were looking at different things and, and, and really praying through what God wanted to to really. Um, do in the teaching ministry of the church over the last few weeks, you knowing we were wrapping up our summer study in Philippians. And, um, and really, this was not anywhere on the radar until a week or two ago. And just through some time in prayer, it just felt really like God wanted us to spend just a few weeks talking about the vision of the body. Um, when you start talking about vision, you know, one of the things, I, I kind of wrote this down on my notes, like what's at stake uh, what is at stake if people don't know why they're doing what they're doing? What, what is at stake if, if Round Prairie Baptist Church, if we don't really understand why we gather? Uh, it's really easy to, to kind of just get in a habit of going to church, right? I mean, uh, I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm, I'm in the habit of going to church, okay? I do get paid to be here, so it's a little different, but, um, but, but I do get, I, I'm in a habit of coming to church, and, and if you're like me, anything that becomes a habit can kind of become routine, and when things become routine, sometimes you forget why you do them, right? Uh, it's kind of like the old story of the, of the, the lady that, you know, passed down uh, this pan that her best pot roast came in. Y'all remember that story? She passed it to her daughter, and it went to her daughter. And pretty soon, a couple of generations down, down the pike, uh, the recipe called for cutting the pot roast in half and putting it in the pan and doing all this stuff. And finally, one day, she looks up and she goes, Grandma, why do we cut the pot roast in half? She goes, it's because that's the only pan I had. So we cut it in half to fit it in that pan. But if you got a different pan, you don't have to cut it in half. Well, sometimes familiarity breeds um, really ineffectual work. You, you don't really get a lot done. It doesn't make sense what you do. And, and, and if you've been in church long, and if you've not been in church, this is going to maybe be news to you, but if you've been in church long, you've been in a church at least sometime in your life where you just kind of do things, but nobody really knows why, right? They may have started off really well, but pretty soon they're just programs that we do that don't really have any real impact on the lives of people. Well, well, at Round Prairie, I really believe that it's important that occasionally we are reminded about why we do what we do. What are we trying to accomplish? What do we feel like God has called us to do as a body of believers? And for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about elements that are necessary or attributes that are necessary uh, for a church to fulfill its vision. We've got a couple of statements that I'm going to read to you, and I'm not big on mission statements and vision statements, but I do like them because I feel like they do kind of keep us focused and tethered to what we're trying to do, and so we need to kind of go back to them occasionally. And our mission statement around Prairie, I think we have it on the, on, the, on the screen up here, is this. We exist to glorify God by making disciples who gather together in biblical fellowship, grow in faith through discipleship, give of ourselves in serving, and go into the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I've got news for you. That shouldn't be a, a wow factor for a church. Every church should be making disciples of the nations, okay? Every single church. If a church has not got disciple-making in its vision or its mission, that church has missed something grand in the Bible. Uh, the, the Great Commission could not be clearer that we are called and commanded to go make disciples of the nations. And so every church kind of shares a similar mission, but we have a vision statement here as to how we feel like that affects kind of how we do it in our particular context with what God's blessed us with, the people, uh, the resources, the, the, the place in the community. And our vision statement's really simple. It's how we're going to do this. And it's this. It, we, we do have the vision statement up there. Can I pop it up there? To be a place where families find life. Because here's what we believe, and here's what I believe, that when a family really experiences a true relationship with Jesus Christ, they will find life like they've never had before. And so if we can, as a church, make disciple-making a priority and we get it into the lives and the homes and the hearts of families, I truly believe people will find life like they've never found before. When you start shooting for something, have you ever heard it said, if you don't shoot for, or if you don't aim for something, you'll hit it every time. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Well, we're going to aim at, at helping families find life 
by, by accomplishing the mission statement uh, of making disciples of the nations. And so, so our goal is to help families interact with the gospel of Jesus Christ and train them up to follow after him. That's, that's really our goal here at Round Prairie. But there's some things that are necessary for any church or any organization to fulfill its vision. And there's four things we're going to talk about, one a week over the next four weeks. Today we're going to talk about unity. Next week we're going to talk about clarity. The next week, ambition. And the last week we're going to talk about sacrifice. So today we're going to kind of hit on this idea of unity in the body of Christ. Unity is the state of being united or joined as a whole. Now, some of y'all watched football yesterday, right? Did anybody watch football? All right. Some of y'all are going to watch football today. Some of y'all are going to watch the Cowboys and whatever that is they do, right? I mean, we're, we all got different things we're going to do, right? But, 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 but we all probably like have watched teams or, or watched sports. I, I watched volleyball yesterday. Let me tell you, you have not lived until you watched uh, the, the Little Digger uh, girls volleyball team, the eight-year-olds, okay? I, I got to watch that yesterday, and, and there, there's a team there too. And um, if you remember, that's my name badge. It was made by Lily, my, my eight-year-old. And when an when a eight-year-old gives you a name badge, you stick it on, okay? And so so it says, um, Chris, Daddy, George, okay? So that's my name badge. But, but I, I spent my whole day yesterday watching volleyball and then, and then watching some college football and even last night watching a little more college football. And everyone knows what it's like uh, to be on a team or see a team that's really not operating as a team. They're, they're just a bunch of individuals out there kind of for their own ambitions and glory, right? Have you, have you ever seen a team like that? And w- there's something that you'll say about a team when they're not really in it for each other and they're not in it for a common goal, we'll say they're selfish, right? And, and, and I was reading just this morning uh, an article about Mark Cuban, who owns the Dallas Mavericks and has own, owns businesses all around, and he said, you know, very often I have to evaluate my teams that I have doing different things. And sometimes he says, you know what, you can have one person on a team that's a knucklehead, but you can't have two. And he said, because the issue is, is, is one knucklehead will adapt, but two will hang out. That's what he said. And so I thought, well, that's, that's pretty clever. We, we might have to change the staff here, right, at Round Prairie. Like, I'm the knucklehead, and, and we don't need another one, right? But, but here's the thing I'm getting at. Is when, you, when you're building a team and when you're working with a group of people, we all know what it's like to have people who are kind of too much in it for themselves. And the problem that, that, that happens with that is, is you can't have a team of, of individuals working to their own goals or the team will never accomplish anything. And so you'll have arguments and you'll have fights. And you see it sometimes on the football field or you see it on the basketball court where their own teammates are bickering at each other and fighting more than they're actually playing the game. It happens at work. Some of us have worked in areas where it's just every man for himself. Have you ever been in a job like that? Maybe you're there now. Don't raise your hand because your boss might be here. But, but, but you're in it, and you're like, man, it's every man for himself. It's just everybody is just doing what they want to do for themselves. And, and what happens is, is teammates, or people quit that job. And, and in church, you know, you have a church that has all sorts of different types of people and different ideas, and people have different ideas of what church should be, and pretty soon people start leaving the church because there's just arguing and bickering all the time. So I'll tell you what's at stake for a church to be on, unified in, in their vision is that the church will not accomplish anything if they're constantly fighting within. And some of y'all may have been in churches like that where they split or they become motionless because you're using all of your energy trying to just keep it afloat. And, and there's no real gospel work being done because we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I, I've, I've seen churches like that. I've been in churches like that where, where, where we had way more arguments and conversations about the things that don't really matter than the things of eternity. Where, where people are more passionate, really, about the building than they are about the people in it. Where, where people get more passionate about the color of the carpet than they do about the souls of the community. And, and when churches become passionate about the wrong things, and we're a group of individuals about our own ambitions, then what happens is the church as a whole begins to slow down in progress, and the kingdom of God is not advanced in that body. And a lot of times what happens is that church begins to decline and become irrelevant, and pretty soon that church is but a memory in this world, and the kingdom of God has to make its way through a different place. You see, it's so important that we understand 
this idea of being unified in vision because the truth is there's so many differences among us. If I went around this room, everyone in this room has different tastes, right? Everyone in this room has different gifts. Everyone has different talents, different ways that God has made you and shaped you, right? And so with that, we probably all have a little bit different passion. And as a pastor, I get the privilege, and I do consider it a privilege, of hearing people's passions and what they think the church should be doing. But, but on the flip side of that, I get the responsibility of hearing three, four hundred people's different, different people's passions, and sometimes those passions aren't lining up with other people's passions. And what will happen is if the church doesn't have the elements that bring unity, the church will begin to have strife. And, and so the, this series is to help us understand our vision and our mission, but also to help us come back to a place that we're always on the same page on the big picture and that we make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. Well, well, church division and this idea of unity is not something new to us. I mean, all throughout the Bible, especially in the New Testament, you see God's people struggling to get on the same page. And in the letter of Ephesians, Paul writes to this church in Ephesus, and he writes really uh, very directly on the importance of unity in the body of Christ. And he's going to talk later on, really after the passage we're reading, he's going to talk about how people are made differently and they have different gifts and all that. Just like today, everybody's a little different, but it doesn't mean we can't work together. We all have different ideas, we all have different ambitions, we all have different passions, but if we keep disciple-making at the forefront, we can come together on what's most important. And in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes this. I want you to hear it, and we're going to look today. This is going to be a two-part series on unity, or a two-part sermon on unity. And, and we're going to do, do one part this week and one part next week. But, but this week, we're going to take really just verse 2 primarily. But I'm going to read um, the first seven verses, and then we're going to kind of put some context on it. But if you've got your Bibles, read with me. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. This is Paul writing. It says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, before we go on any further, Paul in the first three chapters of Ephesians has been writing primarily about the work of God that, that has been done by Jesus Christ on behalf of the Ephesian people, on behalf of Christians everywhere. And he's been writing all the way through the first three chapters all about the work of Jesus Christ. And then in chapters 4, 5, and 6, he is like a response. Now, because Christ has done this in you, you now do this in your life. And so in chapter 4, it's kind of like a hinge of the book. And so he says, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord. So in light of everything God has done up to now, he says, then you need to walk worthy in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Paul's just simply saying this. If God has done the work in you, then it should reflect in the attitude and behaviors moving forward. You need to understand that if God has done incredible work in saving your soul and transforming your life, that now you should walk in a way that matches the work that God's done in you. There, there should be a reflection. It's a, the, the word worthy there is a word we get the word balance from. And he's saying it's, it's like balancing out. God's done this, so now what are you going to do in response to what God's done in you? You need to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And then he says this. Here's how you walk in that worthily. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the spirit of or the unity of the, and the spirit and the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Here's what Paul's saying. Because God's done an incredible work in your life, you now should respond by living from that grace and that gift you've received, by extending that to other people. And you need to, as God's people, since he has saved all of you, you need to walk together as one. And, and he says, oh, here's how you're going to do it. And he gives four character traits in verse 2 that we're going to talk about today really quickly about, that really leads to a, a church that's unified. And this is really where we're going to land today for just the next few minutes. Four character traits that you're going to have to have if you're going to have unity in a church body. And the first one there we see in verse 2 right there. With all 
humility. How many of y'all like the word humility? Anybody? I mean, most of us in, in this room probably don't use the word humility in our everyday language very often. But, but humility is not a bad word. It can, it can carry bad connotation. But really, humility in the Scriptures is really a noble thing. Here's what humility isn't. There's an old quote that says this. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not going around beating yourself up, talking about how bad you are and degrading yourself and, and, and really just punishing yourself. Humility is simply saying, you know what? In light of what God's done in me, I can put others first in my life. You know what? I, I don't have to always have my way. I don't have to always have my desire. I don't have to always have my preferences. I can give way to other people. It's really the opposite of the word pride. And if you really look at the New Testament or you look at the Old Testament, you're going to see this idea of pride versus humility all through the pages of Scripture. And some scholars even would say that pride is like the root of all other sin. And if you really think about it, how many of us would say in most of the conflict in our lives, pride had a lot to do with the conflict? Whether it was the start of the conflict or whether it was the lack of resolution of the conflict, pride doesn't do good things in relationships. How about you? It doesn't do it in my relationships. Here a while back, Julie and I, I'm going to be a little bit transparent here. Julie and I had a little argument, okay? She was wrong, but that's okay. We had a little argument. It's, it's bad being up here. Sometimes you say things you shouldn't say. But we had a little argument, okay? And, and I don't even remember what the argument was about, which is how most of that goes, Right? But we were just kind of at an impasse, and we were just button heads, and, and I was so frustrated, and, and I just decided to take a walk. And so I walk, and it is blistering hot outside. It was one of those 100-degree days, and I just thought it's a great time for a walk, you know. And so I take off walking from my house, and I walk further than I typically walk. Now, I just think God has a funny way of humbling us sometimes, okay? So I'm walking, and I get about two miles away from my house, and I turn around, and I start walking back. But back, back is up a lot, okay? So when I get about a quarter of the way back, I ain't feeling good. Like, I'm not feeling right. I don't have enough, you know, juice in me. I'm like dehydrated feeling. I'm my mouth starting to stick together. Now I have my phone, and, and, I, and I can call Julie to come pick me up. Ah, I, I, that ain't happening, right? I mean, like, I mean, like, I was sitting there, and I literally was thinking to myself, I was like, I, I mean, I think I even, I'm, like, I'm not calling her. I'm not calling her. I, I'll make it. I'll die out here before I call her, <laughs> right? And I'm walking all the way back home, and I get about a mile into that half, I'm about halfway back home with that two-mile stretch, and, and my world starts spinning a little bit, and everything starts getting dark. And I just sat there. And I had to call her, and I called her and said, can you please come get me? <laughs> and she came, and in her, to her credit, she did not do what I would have done to her. She just picked me up and like, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. What I'm not okay with, though, is humbling myself and making you think that I need you right now. That's what I'm not okay with, right? So, so pride... <laughs> Almost killed your pastor. Okay, that's what I'm saying. But most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, the unwillingness to give way to others, the unwillingness to sometimes even admit we're wrong, uh, the unwillingness to, to give up maybe our desire, our preference, our image, oftentimes has been a big part of the reason we have conflict in churches. And a lot of churches, uh, they, they struggle in a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of organizations, but churches specifically, I think this particular church, what Paul's really probably dealing with, if you look at the last part, or later in that, ver the, that, that chapter, it's really people have all these gifts, and, and like anywhere else, everybody's kind of proud of what they have to offer, right? This person has this, this person has that. And, and everyone in this room, we're kind of prone to the same thing. Well, well and we, we look at what we have to give or, or what we want or what we desire, and, and we kind of don't look at other people. And what happens is we become consumers of church instead of contributors to church. We become consumers of Christianity instead of servants of God. And when we do that, we're dead in the water because when you start having a church filled with consumers, then everybody has a different thing that they want. And the problem is the mission of the gospel gets lost in the process. And that's why we have to come back to things like this and go, remember, we're on mission. Remember, we have a vision. We have a direction. And, and it's bigger than any one of our preferences or desires. 
when we came over to Round Prairie, and when we came over to this building, I'm going to share this with you all. This was huge, and I've not shared this from, from the pulpit yet, but back when we first started, uh, when I came to Round Prairie, and, and we were blessed with some growth, we, we started a second service upstairs, and, and we called it the loft, and some of you all started at Round Prairie when we started that second service, and, and we saw God grow that, and, and then we saw the need to, there was a desire for everybody to come back together. Well, the problem was we were a church of two different worship styles at that point. We had a, a very contemporary style, and we had a very traditional style. And, and, and through a lot of prayer and counsel, we felt like as a staff, that, and, and I felt like just personally as a pastor, that really we needed to, to, to decide the church we were going to be and be unified in that church. And, and, and so when we came back together, we had a town hall meeting one night. How many of y'all were there? Do y'all remember this town hall meeting? We had a town hall meeting, and we just said, look, I will answer every question that I possibly can, but um, I, I just want to give you all the opportunity to ask them. And, and I came into the, to the fellowship hall, and we ate that night, and we talked, and, and I got a lot of questions. And, and, and the question was this, well, wh- which way are we headed, Pastor? Are we going to keep, you know, are we going to do a blend? Are we going to do this? I said, look, I really feel compelled to tell you all. Like, I'm not going to lie. I really think we need to move in this direction. And the loft was growing by leaps and bounds. And we said, we want to go with that style of ministry. And, and still to this day, I know it's a little uncomfortable for some people in the room. But I want to tell you something that a lot of y'all don't know happened. The very next day, someone came into my office. And, um, and, and they looked at me and said, Preacher, I want you to know that me and my wife were talking when we were on the way home. And we don't like that new music. I said, yes, sir. I, I didn't think you would. And we don't really like a lot of change. I said, yes, sir. I understand that. He said, we're not really, you know, we're not for so, so many of these new things. We don't, we're, not, we're not familiar with them. And I said, yes, sir. And then he said this. But we believe that you follow God. And we're in. It was in one month, him, his spouse, had multiple kids, multiple grandkids all around them checking out what we were doing here at Round Prairie. And I want to tell you something. That requires humility. It requires humility to go, you know what? It's not my favorite. It's not my, what I love. It's not what I'm familiar with. But if it will somehow reach the next generation, I'm in. And I want to tell you all, as a pastor of a church, I get a lot of questions from people who, who are around the BMA, and they ask me questions about, well, how are y'all doing this at Round Prairie? I mean, I mean you just, y'all just seem like it's, it's just going so easy. I said, you know what? I'm going to be honest with y'all. It's the people there have been willing to humble themselves and give way to what would be best for the kingdom. And when you have people willing to submit for the work of the kingdom, anything is possible. And I just want to give you all your props because that's been a huge, huge help um, as a pastor. Just to have people willing to jump on board and say, you know what, we're going to give way with what we want sometimes for the sake of the gospel. And I'm telling you, that takes humility. It takes giving up sometimes what you want. But y'all have done a great job, and I appreciate that. And I've seen, we've seen God bless that. But the second thing that unity requires in this passage is, is gentleness. Now, gentleness is really the outworking of humility. Humility is kind of the attitude, and gentleness really should come from humility. Gentleness is how we approach people um, in the way in which we bring truth and and, and conversation. One of the most challenging things that young pastors go through and and, and face, I believe, is that they might have the right information, the right ideas, and even the Word of God on their side, but presenting it sometimes is not done with gentleness. And then a lot of harm and a lot of damage is done, not because of the Word of God, but it's because of how it's presented. Have y'all ever experienced that before? You know what I'm talking about? It's not so much what somebody says, but it's how they say it. That's what we're talking about when we hear the word gentleness. We're talking about this idea that it's not just enough to have the truth. You need to have the truth and say it in a way that is loving. It's it's guided by love and an idea that we're together and an idea that we need to go, all, all of us need to go and get on board with the same thing. And sometimes just because you have the truth, you might become a little abrasive. And Paul says, it's important if you're going to have unity that you understand that it's not just humility. You need to walk with gentleness. How you approach people matters. And the reason I tell you that is because many times in churches and in other places, you hear people say things like, well, I just tell it like it is. Well, I'm going to be honest. Maybe you need to change the way you tell it. 
If the way you tell it is abrasive and offensive and people scatter from you like you're a rat carrying the plague when you walk into the room, maybe you need to change your approach. I know some people, it's a badge of honor that they can, can divide a church and whittle it down to the real saints. The problem is, is that's not gentleness. And I've, I've seen people wear as a badge of honor this idea that, well, I'm a prophet. I just tell it like it is. Well, guess what? There's a place and there's a time for that. But if your passion doesn't have compassion, you're probably missing something. It matters how we approach one another. And gentleness and how we speak is a big part of this. This idea that you can take it or leave it. If the truth hurts, that's your problem. I mean, the reality is, guys, is I'm about 40 pounds overweight. And you can tell me that, but the way you tell me that's probably going to determine what I do. And if you just walk by me and say, hey, fatty, I'm probably not going to respond. Right? I mean, there's a way to do it. The truth's there. I mean, yeah, you're right. You're not wrong. Right? Hey, you're looking a little fat today, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate that, right? What you said is true, but it's not very helpful. You see, there's a way to have truth that's hard, but spoken in love. And that's what's lacking in many churches today, is we feel like if we have the right information, that that gives us some superiority where we can stand and look down and cast it all down on people, and they just have to respond. Reality is, is people don't usually live like that. People care how we present the information. Amen? It is. There's people that leave churches every single Sunday and they never go back in the doors. Not because the truth wasn't preached. It's because of how it was preached. It was because of how it was said. So having the truth is not enough. Sometimes you need to have that truth bathed with a little bit of love. And we're told that in the Bible, that we are to speak the truth in love. And if I could tell existing congregations one thing it would be speak the truth but do it in love i can't tell you how many churches i've heard over the years brag about churching people and what they mean by that is you know that person was dancing and they kicked them out and, and there's almost this once again this superiority that people well for one thing i tell you all the time I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna shoot you straight the bible as far as i'm concerned doesn't forbid dancing but the way that baptist rhythm works probably should okay like, I tell people all the time, they're like, Baptists don't dance. I'm like, well, Baptists shouldn't dance, probably. You know, there is a difference, right? But, but the bragging of, like, we church this person, we set them straight, we got them where they... Let's be cautious, because Paul says to this church in Ephesus, and Paul really didn't mince words, and even he says, there needs to be gentleness in your ministry. There needs to be some compassion in how you deal with people, what you say is important, but how you say it is as well. So speak the truth in love. And then thirdly, look at the third attribute, the character he, uh, trait he, he describes here. He uses the word patience. Now patience, if you look at the definition, is this. It's the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. I don't know about that part, but I know this, that patience is something that's really, really hard to get, and it's really, really easy to lose. Have y'all ever noticed that? Like, how many of y'all have ever made a commitment to be patient today, and then it's like 9 a.m., and that, that's gone? You with me? I'm going to be more patient. I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to do it, you know, and, and, then, and then everybody in your house wakes up, right? <laughs> you know, like, I'm going to be patient today. I'm going to do it. And, man, as long as we're on our own, and we're, it's just us and the Lord and our Bible, we are so patient, right? I mean, like, I am, I am a noble man when it's just me and the Lord, right? I, I can just sit there, man, I'm just feeling, I'm patient today. But then the problem is, is people wake up, and you have to deal with them. Well, it's the same thing in church, right? It's the same thing in any relationship, that, that, that it's easy to be patient in a vacuum. It's hard to be patient when people rub you the wrong way. And it's easy to begin to lose your temper, lose your cool, lose whatever you lose when people don't behave like you want them to. And, and the problem with that is, is, is when we begin to react quickly in uncomfortable situations, we almost always act poorly. As a matter of fact, I've got this saying that I tell people when they come to me, and not even in situations like that, but when they're trying to decide what it is God might be doing in their life, and they're kind of in a waiting period, and they're like, well, I'm thinking about doing this, and I'm thinking about doing that, and I, I want to do this, and I want to do that. I tell them this, and this, is, this has served me very well. Not that I've always heeded it, okay, but, but this has served me well. Rash decisions 
are rarely good decisions. The ability to step back and wait to see what God might do is a virtue worth pursuing. There's people that sometimes we interact with and we want to set them straight. You know what I've learned? I can't set anybody straight. Like, like really, let's just be honest. If we're really honest with ourselves, we can, we can yell, we can scream, we can manipulate, we can coerce. But at the end of the day, have you ever really changed a heart yourself? But here's the cool thing. When we have patience, we're saying, God, I'm going to give time for you to work. And when we're being impatient, we're typically saying, God, I don't trust you to work. I'm going to take care of it myself. And it's hard to have unity in a body of people when we're constantly trying to fix the people around us. Sometimes we have to take a step back and just let God do the work. And it's amazing how much better God is at his job than me. But it takes patience. And if you want to have unity in a body of believers, there has to be kind of a collective understanding that we're all going to have to be a little patient. There's going to be times that I say something that you're going to want to pop back. And there's going to be times that you say something that I'm going to want to say something back. And really the virtue we should be after is, hang on, let me just pause and think about that one for a minute. Just a couple of weeks ago, I didn't even tell them, and I'm not going to tell them who it is right now. I got an email from someone, came to the church office, and they, were, they, they said something. And they were, they were making a request of something. And it just rubbed me the wrong way. It just really rubbed me the wrong way. I'm not going to lie. It just rubbed me the wrong way. And I was like, what in the world's wrong with them? Like, why don't they do it? What are they talking about? And, and I just was in my mind, man, it was building up. Am I the only one that that happens to? Right? Like, you just build it up in your head, and, and pretty soon, you done told their mama off. You done turned their daddy. You already got three jokes, you know, to, to cut them down. Like, I mean, it's not good, okay? But, but, but I was already there until I looked at the email, and I read it again, and I went, Wait. That's not what they meant. But I was so quick to want to jump that had I contacted them, I would have looked like an absolute fool. Because when I reread the email, it was one of those things like, hey, you can't eat too much fish, right? Well, what does that mean? You can't eat too much fish like it's bad for you, or you can't too eat too much fish. It's amazing, right? I mean, it can mean either thing. And when but what I found is I almost blew it with this person simply by being hasty. And you can't be unified of the church if you're going to be hasty because we're going to always have things that we're not really sure about. And so he says you've got to be patient. Unity requires some patience with one another. And lastly, unity requires understanding. I love the way this part of the passage translates out. He says, bearing with one another it literally translates out this way putting up with can i be really honest with y'all sometimes i need you just to put up with me i'm gonna mess up as a pastor i'm gonna need somebody every now and then just to put up with me because it's not intentional i don't mean to be a bonehead i'm just i am sometimes right and if we're fair you are too right if we're fair and we're honest, we, we all can be flawed. We're all flawed. We can all mess up. And there's times that we're going to have to look at each other as a brother or sister in Christ and just go, you know what, I'm just going to kind of put up with that one right now. Not everything has to be corrected right this moment. Sometimes I just have to overlook the faults of the people around me because I'm sure hoping they overlook mine. There's a great book out by um, a guy named uh, Paul David Tripp, and he's a pastor of pastors. And he tells a story when he was a young pastor in a church that he had just really blown it. He had really messed up. Um, he said just leadership after leadership issues, just not handling things correctly, not, not doing, you know, calling the right meetings, not getting the right people involved. He said it was a mess. He said, and I'll never forget, he said this week was a turning point in my ministry because I didn't know what I was going to do. He said, I'm a young pastor, and I've just really made a mess of this first church I'm at. He said, I'm sitting there, and, I, and I'm saying all my goodbyes to everybody. I've already told the church I'm leaving, and you know, most of them are happy. He said, but he said, I'll never forget, I had one more meeting with a pretty prominent um, elder in the church, and he said, 
And I kind of dreaded it, but I was going ahead and getting ready for it. And he said, I, I sat there, and I, 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 the day of the meeting comes up, and it's like the last meeting. I'm like, and I'm out of here. He said, and this older gentleman looks at me and said, Pastor, you've really screwed up here. He goes, yes, sir, I know. He said, and you've really made a mess of a lot of things. He said, yes, sir, I'm, I'm aware. He said, and pastors, you, you, there's a lot you don't know. He said, yes, sir, I, I know. He said, but you don't have to leave. He said, why do you have to leave just because you messed up? We want you to stay, and we'll love you through this. And we can, we can help you grow through this. But if you leave every time you mess up, you're never going to grow. And that church loved him and let him grow and mature there. And I think about him and think about how many thousands of pastors through the last dec few decades now have been blessed because of that church's faithfulness not to discard someone just because they messed up. How many hundreds of thousands of church, uh, of church members have been blessed because of the leadership lessons from this gentleman because one church decided you don't just throw a man away. You don't just toss him to the side. There's a process to restore people who are broken. And I want to tell you as a church, we'll never have unity if every time someone has a blunder, we toss them out with the garbage We'll never have unity if every time that someone sees somebody slip up, that they're just tossed to the side as if they don't matter. Yes, there are hard conversations. Yes, there's accountability. But there's also restoration and hope and grace in Jesus Christ. And not one of us in this room is sitting here because we had it all together. Amen? Not one of us is eternally secure because we had the, the formula figured out. Every one of us, if we sit here and we have hope of eternity with Jesus Christ, it's because we realize that we were hopeless on our own. And without the work and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, we had no future. But because of him, we have hope. And guess what? That's the grace, that's the mercy, that's the love that we should extend to people around us. And that's what Paul's really urging them to do in light of everything Christ has done for you. You did this for others. Well, as we have the musicians come up, I'm going to answer one question that I think is probably looming out there. How do we do this? I mean, it's one thing to talk about it, but how do we actually get these qualities? How do I, how do I get humility and gentleness and patience and understanding? How, I mean, I try, Chris. I, I, I make every effort. I read the self-help books. I, you know, I read the seven habits of highly effective people. Whatever it is you try, you know, I, I do everything I can. I, I'm trying well, here's the crazy thing. You don't get these attributes by trying harder. You don't get patience by, I'm going to be more patient. You don't get humility by, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to knuckle down, I'm going to be more humble. These things come from a fruit. They're, they're, they're more fruit. They come off of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, in Galatians, we have the fruit of the Spirit, and we, we, we see that Paul talks about to that church that, that if, if that, that if you walk in the Spirit, that you won't gratify the sinful nature. In other words, if you walk according in, with the Spirit, then, then you'll naturally begin to do the things that we're talking about, and you won't fulfill the desires of your flesh. And, and then he goes on and he says, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is this. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Paul says this, if you really want a life, marked by these kinds of things then it's going to be found not in trying harder but in going deeper with Jesus this life is only possible as the spirit of God flows out of you and spills into the lives of other people it's not going to happen because you try harder and so when we go to a passage like this it, it shouldn't be our goal to just try harder to, to do these things, it should be our goal to go to Jesus more. And that's so counterintuitive because most of us think the answer is if I can just get my behavior better, we'll be in good shape. This is a heart issue. This is a heart issue. So tomorrow morning when you wake up and you think about this, go to Jesus with it. 
begin to walk in the Spirit. Begin to pray prayers that are deep and the substance, that go first, further than thank you for the meal, thank you for this, thank you for that, amen. Go deeper, Jesus. God, I need you today. God, I can't do this on my own. God, I want to walk with you. I want your ways to be like mine. I mean, I want my ways to become like your ways. And, and, and I, want to, I want to think like Jesus thinks. I want to see people like Jesus sees them. Because here's the thing. When we really start seeing the world that way, humility is natural. Compassion, gentleness is natural. Patience is a lot easier to come by when God begins to do the work in us. So we're having a quick time of response right now. What I want to give you all the opportunity to do is a couple of things. One is to begin to pray that prayer that I'm going to walk in the Spirit. I want to live, God, walking day by day with you so that those things become more natural. But here's the second thing, and this is super practical, and and it's, it's really not hard. There may be someone in this room that you have in your mind some people that man, you just have division with. Maybe it's a believer. Maybe they're in another church. Maybe they're in this church. I don't know. But y'all had a rift somewhere along the way in your relationship. And you've just kind of tossed that relationship to the side and said, it doesn't matter. They don't matter. Can I encourage you tonight or today to begin to seek some restoration in that relationship? Begin to extend some grace that you've been extended by Christ. And begin to make peace in some of those places where there's brokenness. Well, yeah, but you don't know what they did. It doesn't matter. I know what Jesus did for you. And there's no offense greater than the gap of my sin with my Savior that he willingly crossed. There's nothing greater, no greater offense that someone can do to me than what I've already offended Christ with. Well, Chris, you know, they're the ones that are wrong. It doesn't matter. Go to them. Seek reconciliation. Because honestly, as long as you harbor that, you're never going to progress in your walk either.